have here the uh, director of the Atlantic Council Eurasia program and former ambassador to Ukraine, uh, John Herbst, and it's not the first time we are talking, but really great to have you in the studio. We wanted to talk about the U.S. strategy, but definitely following up, for instance, the stories like that. We uh, really would love uh, to know, um, you were, for instance, one of the authors of the uh, report on providing Ukraine with the uh, weapon. It's, there was always this uh, concern about the use of it by, for instance, the, by volunteer battalions. How the situations like that, like we have now, could influence and on what the further development depends? Well, uh, I think this is a, a, a very sad and dangerous development for Ukraine, first and foremost. Uh, people have been talking about the possible danger of uh, militias representing a separate source of authority, um, having their own weapons to impose their will. But this was always a theoretical conversation until, until yesterday. And but fact, there's been concern about right-wing groups. I mean, they passed an amendment, correct, in U.S. military aid and training. I'll, with get, I'll, I'll get to that. But my, my point is this. This is very dangerous for Ukraine without reference to weapons from the United States. But I will answer your question on weapons of the United States. Um, I think, one, the leadership of the country has to come out strongly and use the forces of security in this country to mete out justice to those in the, in the right sector who tried to take the law into their own hands. That's point one. Point two, if the leadership of the right sector considers themselves to be responsible politicians, they have to condemn the action of their own members, or the people who are acting in the name of right sector. Because as Mustafa said, this is a brand as much as an organization. So we need to see responsible activity from the leadership of the country and the leadership of right sector. What would responsible activity be? I mean, would it be handing these people con over to con the police? Con condemnation by the president, the prime minister on the one hand, and using law enforcement to go after the criminals, the criminals from right sector. And the leadership of right mm -hmm. sector has to, has to condemn the actions of those who use um, RPGs in, in Lviv. That's completely unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So that's the most important thing. They should do it for the sake of the country without reference to the impact in the United States. But of course, this is not a good development in terms of American support for Ukraine. Because the people who don't want the United States to support Ukraine dealing with Kremlin aggression will use this as a reason not for the, for the United States not to provide weapons. Well, because it, it fits with that Kremlin propaganda of, you know, these right-wing groups being violent. But my well, question is, I mean, I think there's a, I forget exactly what the term is, but there's one the U.S. uses, you know, when groups are, are armed and are given weapons that, I don't know if it's blowback or something like that, that then those weapons are used in situations where they shouldn't be used as well. And that seems to be part of what's happening, even though these weapons were not provided well, by the I, U.S. I or others. I don't want to overstate the impact of this incident on the possible supply of American weapons. Mm -hmm. Because the United States position always was that we would provide weapons or we, may, we, we might provide weapons to the government of Ukraine, to the Ministry of Defense, to the Army of Ukraine, to other security forces in the country, not to the private militias. Mm -hmm. So that has always been the position of the United States. The assistance they give is not going to be to private militias. So when it comes to Azov, I mean, what was this far, this right-wing militia, which is under the you know, military now, under that umbrella, they had this amendment that was introduced in U.S. It was Congress. introduced. My understanding that that amendment has no standing. Mm -hmm. um, and that amendment was clearly put in by people who didn't know much was going on in Ukraine. And they decided to put this amendment in. And someone put them up to that, probably. But uh, again, that's a separate, albeit related issue. Uh, and that was only about, that had to do with the fact that the leader of Azov has said extremist and anti-Semitic um, things in the past, which is also a nasty thing, and he should, re he should um, renounce those statements. But what's happened in Mukachevo is very, very dangerous. The leadership of the country, the leadership of the right sector should do the right thing. And the people responsible for violence from the right sector should be brought to justice. At the same time, this also speaks to the importance in Ukraine of the authorities truly going after corruption and not just talking about it. Mm -hmm. And if I we, mean, mm -hmm. when I was ambassador here 10 years ago, we all knew Mukachevo was a great area for smuggling across the border, right? That was true under President Kuchma, it was true under President Yushchenko. It seems to be true under President Poroshenko. Something should be done about that. So that there's no excuse for extremists with arms, in this case, the right sector, to go after corruption because the government's doing that.
Mm -hmm. Now, if we take a step back and talk about geopolitics, I right. mean, is interest in Ukraine and the U.S. waning at this point? I mean, if we talk about Capitol Hill and politicians, I mean, no, what, what is that um, like? Congress is strongly in favor of providing serious assistance to Ukraine, both economic and military. Mm -hmm. And that's only going to become stronger. Why? Or well, because it's, it's becoming increasingly clear to American elites that the greatest national security danger to the United States today is Vladimir Putin's Russia. It's not Russia by itself, it's the um, revisionist, aggressive policies of the Kremlin. So I think you know that um, earlier this last week, or excuse me, late last week, the president's choice to be the new chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Dunford, said it before Congress that the greatest danger to the United States is the Kremlin. Not ISIL, not Iran, not China. He said the greatest danger is the Kremlin. But I mean, that seems to be a discussion. That's not something everyone would agree with. And it seems like aid, focus, discussion time, especially media attention, which influence all these things. Well, let's understand something. Um, you often have in all capitals, including Washington, people um, are very loud, but not very knowledgeable. I think that what the statement by General Dunford means that the adults are returning to run American national security policy. You're right that it's a debate whether, whether the Kremlin is more dangerous than ISIL. But any serious strategic thinker understands that that's a silly debate. ISIL is a small terrorist organization. It is not an existential threat to the United States. It is an existential threat to individual Americans who happen to be located in the Middle East because they can become victims of terrorism. But what about the people who hear that and you know, are concerned about escalation, that don't see Russia in its current form as a threat to the US, but are worried about you know, if there Which are- people? I'm sorry, well, people who are concerned about nuclear war, for example. Um, these people are not very serious thinkers. Look, uh, I believe strongly uh, that the Kremlin is the greatest danger right now facing global security. But the Kremlin today is a much smaller threat than the Soviet Union was. And we took very serious, strong measures to contain the Soviet Union, to prevent Kremlin aggression at that time. And it did not lead to nuclear war. So the people who are worried about nuclear war with Mr. Putin, I frankly don't know what they're talking about. John, uh, but when you speak about this being the greatest danger, uh, w what do you mean by that? What do you mean by this danger? We understand with ISIL, for instance, you know, like overtaking more land, you know, with international terrorism, terrorist attacks all over Europe or North Africa. Okay. But this what is, is with Russia? I mean, the Ukrainians feel that, they understand. Well, certainly the Kremlin is an existential threat to Ukraine. It's conducting a war in this country. Yeah. Um, but the West is slowly waking up to the fact that Mr. Putin's ambitions go far beyond Ukraine. He has said many times, Mr. Lavrov has said many times, Mr. Sergei Ivanov has said many times, and the Siloviki in general in the Kremlin have said many times that they believe that you need to change the rules that were established at the end of the Cold War. They are frankly revisionist. They say, and this was true at the Valdai conference, if you looked at the Valdai conference just a few weeks ago, on, there were signs behind Mr. Putin that said, Valdai conference, global order, new rules or no rules. Mm -hmm. That's an explicit danger to the peace established in Europe 25 years ago. And that peace has been absolutely critical for European and global security, for European and global prosperity. And Mr. Putin wants to change all that. He began his revisionist policies with the war against Georgia in 2008. He continued them with the war against Ukraine last year and now. But Mr. Putin has made clear his ambitions extend to the Baltic states, which are members of NATO. They extend to Kazakhstan, which he calls an artificial country. He is on the march. We need to stop him. General, Fuldun General Dunford, who is President <coughs> Obama's choice to be the chief military man, has said the Kremlin is the chief danger. Washington is waking up, and so is Europe. The, uh, Washington is waking up, but what's about Europe? And uh, how different is this discord at this point? Well, because there is always a debate that, um, by, by the way, very different debate. Sometimes somebody said it's the US who is pushing. Sometimes said like, oh, US isn't doing enough. It's Europe who is dealing. So what is the strategy well, for Europe at the point? Well, the Europe is one or two steps behind Washington, which is where Western Europe usually is. During the Cold War, you needed strong American leadership to take serious security measures. For example, the deployment of intermediate range nuclear missiles into Europe in the, in the early and mid, mid 80s came as a result of American leadership. The European leaders were reluctant. 
So Washington is waking up. Um, again, not everyone in Washington has, has, got, has awakened. If everyone in Washington had awakened, we'd be sending weapons to Ukraine. General Dunford said we should be sending weapons to Ukraine. But when you say Europe's behind, when we look at something like the Normandy format in Minsk, I mean, right. they are the ones sitting at the table, unlike the U.S. You have Correct. Friend. Because the United States w did not understand the great dangers of the Kremlin activities until recently. Uh, that's why Mr. Obama said, mistakenly, that the crisis in Ukraine is a regional crisis, a European crisis, not a global crisis. It is a global crisis because the Kremlin is one of the world's two great nuclear powers, and it is changing borders by military force. That is the largest threat to global security today. And once Washington, and because Mr. Obama did not understand this, he said, okay, Chancellor Merkel, you can take the lead. But while Chancellor Merkel, um, I think, has done pretty good work, in fact, excellent work on sanctions, she is not in a position to lead on global security because Germany is not a superpower. You need the United States. And as Washington comes to a clear understanding of the danger represented by the Kremlin, it will exert the leadership necessary to bring Europe along to take the necessary measures. We're already seeing this a little bit. Ash Carter, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, was in Europe a few weeks ago. He was there to announce that military hardware is going to, into Poland and into the Baltic states, an important step to prevent Kremlin aggression against the Baltic states. Uh, you know. Nine months ago, 10 months ago, at Wales, the NATO summit, NATO leaders said in a very short-sighted way, an almost laughable way, that ISIL was an existential threat to the alliance and Russia was not. That's silly. ISIL is this big as a security threat. Not to be diminished, but this big. The Kremlin is huge. Coming back to the um, you know clear steps, so so far, for instance, the U.S. is training the uh, the U.S. military are training the Ukrainian military, but we are speaking about a few uh, big less than 100 people. So, um, so what comes next? What we can expect? Well, uh, I know that. Um, Washington is, is still giving the Minsk process a chance, even though they think it has failed. Um, Europe is still giving the Minsk process a chance. Uh, I think as the West realizes that Kremlin aggression has continued since Minsk II, it will take stronger measures. I mean, for example, um, I don't know the exact number, but a few weeks ago, over 110 Ukrainian soldiers had died since February 15, when the Minsk II ceasefire began. 28 towns and villages were seized by the separatists and their Russian backers since February 15. Over 200 square kilometers of Ukrainian territory was taken by the Russians and their proxies in eastern Ukraine since Minsk II was signed, since it went into effect on February 15. Um, as Washington and Europe come to understand that, I think they will adopt firmer measures still. And of course, if the Kremlin is foolish enough to try and seize Mariupol, I think those stronger Western measures will come faster. Okay. All right. Thank you.